In today's brief, we'll talk about Udajaina, an attack on a Swedish facility, and so many drones. I'm Linnea, and today is Wednesday, August 16th, 2023. You're listening to the Ukraine War Brief podcast, where we bring you up to speed on the war in Ukraine in about 20 minutes or less. Let's get started with the news in Ukraine from the front. Russian forces continue to suffer significant losses, according to the General Staff of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, or GSAFU, with 650 Russian personnel reported, quote, liquidated on August 15th, along with 11 Russian tanks, 10 armored vehicles, 24 artillery systems, and three anti-aircraft systems. The counteroffensive remains heavily impacted by Russian mines. Ukraine is currently the most heavily mined country in the world, as we've mentioned in previous episodes, which plays a massive role in setting the pace of Ukrainian advances along the front. Ukrainian Minister of Defense Oleksii Reznikov said in an interview with The Guardian that along some parts of the front line, soldiers are encountering as many as five mines per square meter. Not square kilometer, square meter. For some perspective, that would be approximately 85 mines in an area the size of a typical parking space. In the eastern theater of operations, Russian forces appear to be regrouping in the Kupiansk and Liman directions, with Ukrainian Deputy Defense Minister Hanna Malyar noting a decrease in the frequency of attacks and artillery strikes over the past few days. Deputy Minister Malyar also reported that Ukrainian forces have liberated three square kilometers on the Bakhmut front over the past week, making a total of 40 square kilometers liberated on the southern flank of the Bakhmut front since the start of the counteroffensive. The Ukrainian Air Force also reportedly shot down a Russian helicopter in the area on August 14th. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky visited the headquarters of brigades fighting in the Bakhmut area on Monday, saying, quote, Every day I receive general information, which gives me a broad understanding of the situation, but I wanted to visit all the brigades individually to understand the problems of each of them, end quote. In the southern theater of operations, Ukrainian and Russian sources reported that Russian forces have withdrawn from Urozhaina, southwest of Saromaiske, on the border between Donetsk and Zaporizhia oblasts. Ukrainian forces had partial success in the Berdyansk and Melitopol directions near Robotine in western Zaporizhia oblast. Russian command is being forced to consider moving troops away from Zaporizhia to reinforce positions on the left bank, that would be the occupied bank, of the Dnipro River near Kherson, where Ukrainian forces have made some gains. Moving on to the home front, two people were killed in a Russian attack on Zaporizhia Oblast overnight on August 13th to 14th, and a man was killed and five people were injured in Kosacha Lopan during attacks on Kharkiv Oblast on August 14th. Russian forces attacked Odessa multiple times, and Ukrainian air defenses were able to intercept 15 drones and 8 caliber cruise missiles. Debris from the downed missiles reportedly started fires in a supermarket and a dormitory, injuring three people. Valery Shaitanov, a former major general of the Security Service of Ukraine, or SBU, was convicted of treason for collecting state secrets and passing them to the Russian FSB. Shaitanov has been sentenced to 12 years in prison. Russian forces used up a lot of resources last year targeting energy infrastructure in Ukraine, and according to Ukrainian Prime Minister Denis Shmihal, as of August 13th, 80% of the main power grids and high-voltage stations damaged by Russian attacks have been restored to their pre-war condition. Kyiv expects Russian forces to resume air attacks on Ukrainian energy infrastructure in the fall in an effort to cause blackouts across the country like they did last winter. The Ukrainian Air Force reported a massive missile strike on central and western Ukraine overnight on August 14th to 15th, targeting seven oblasts with 28 air and sea-launched missiles, killing three and doing significant damage. Air defenses were reportedly only able to intercept 16 caliber cruise missiles. Fifteen people were wounded in Lviv, including a child, with Russian missiles striking an apartment building, about 40 private houses, and a kindergarten. Houses were damaged in Ivano-Frankivsk, a sport facility was targeted in Dnipro, and an industrial facility in Lutsk. 
The industrial facility in Lutsk was used by Swedish company SKF, which issued a statement following the attack, quote, We are very sad to confirm that three of our employees died in this attack, end quote. Russia's Ministry of Defense, or MOD, reported that it had carried out so-called long-range precision strikes on alleged key military purpose industrial facilities, stating that, quote, Ukraine's military industrial complex suffered significant damage, end quote. So the Swedish factory made ball bearings, small metal spheres typically of high carbon chromium steel that are used in the manufacture of pretty much everything with moving parts. We're spotted trying to cross the border into Ukraine near novgorod siversky in Cherniv Oblast, but were unsuccessful. Prime Minister Shmihal announced that the Ukrainian government has allocated over 1.2 billion hryvnias, that's roughly 34 million U.S. dollars, to strengthen the defense of Kharkiv and Cherniv Oblasts. The 330 kilovolt power line that supplies the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was shut down on August 15th due to damage that occurred to the power line on the territory of Belarus. The main power lines of Ukraine's state-owned energy company Ukrenerho were shut down three times on the 15th. If you're enjoying the episode, please rate us and leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us via email at social at borlingen.media. That's B-O-R-L-I-N-G-O-N dot media. Speaking of shutting down and losing power, let's talk about the Russian Federation and effectively occupied Belarus. The Institute for the Study of War, or ISW, reported on August 13th that pro-war Russian bloggers are complaining of poor morale and personnel failures after Ukrainian troops made gains in Uruzhina, with one blogger claiming that Russian soldiers, quote, prematurely withdrew because the unit's personnel were drunk, end quote. Multiple analysts see the dissolution of the Russian Federation as a possible outcome of Russian president-slash-dictator Vladimir Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine. While some, like Hudson Institute's Luke Coffey, have posited that it is actually the last gasp of the Soviet Union, some have expressed fear that it would not go smoothly. Washington Post columnist David Ignatius said, quote, a fragmented, demoralized Russia is a devil's playground. Russia's internal disarray poses a severe dilemma for Putin, but it's very dangerous for the West, too. End quote. Implying that a less predictable Russia would be more dangerous, even if it lacked the economic, military, or diplomatic resources to continue with its imperialist agenda. The ruble hit a 17 month low against the dollar on August 14th having lost nearly 40% of its value this year and weakened past 100 rubles to the dollar. The continued decline illustrates the growing pressure on Russia's economy from Western sanctions and a drop in export revenues. Russia's central bank hiked its key interest rate to 12% on August 15th in an effort to stop the ruble's precipitous decline. Russian military event Armia 2023 Forum isn't living up to expectations. While Russia touts that 80 to 85 delegations are present, only six nations are reported to be taking part – Belarus, Iran, Vietnam, India, China, and Pakistan. Sounds like a really fun party. State-run media outlet TASS reported explosions at the Tallinn oil field in Tumen Oblast, with at least two dead and five injured at the time of recording. The cause of the explosion was not reported. A gas station in Mahachkala was also rocked by an explosion, with at least three people reported dead. Let's talk about the news worldwide. Sorin Grindianu, Minister of Transport and Infrastructure of Romania, announced that Romania wants to double the transit capacity of Ukrainian grain to 4 million tons per month. Noting that it's critical to optimize the capacity of the Solina branch as the, quote, only viable waterway, end quote, for grain transit. Three Bulgarian citizens were arrested in the United Kingdom on suspicion of espionage, according to the BBC. Detained back in February, the three have been accused of working for the Russian Security Services, or FSB. Stian Hjensen, chief of staff to NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, 
proposed that Ukraine surrender some portion of its territory to Russia in order to end the war, saying, quote, I think that a solution could be for Ukraine to give up territory and get NATO membership in return, end quote. The Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Affairs was not impressed and called the proposal, quote, unacceptable. Let's talk military tech. The United States waited more than a year before allowing NATO countries to send F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine, and further delays in training mean that by the time Ukrainian pilots are able to use the aircraft in combat operations, it will be too late to have any impact on the current phase of fighting. Officials and experts in Ukraine, Europe, and the United States, however, believe that Ukraine can succeed in its counteroffensive without F-16s, though it is likely to be a lot more difficult, since the lack of air superiority, a critical component of the NATO combined arms approach, puts Ukraine at a disadvantage against Russian attack helicopters, at least some of which are armed with anti-tank missiles that are fired too low to be intercepted by Ukrainian air defenses. Some assessment here. Western experts provided most of the equipment and training for Ukrainian forces to adopt a combined arms approach, which is how most of these weapon systems and military formations are designed to be used. They completely ignored, however, that a central tenet of combined arms warfare is maintaining air superiority over the battle space. Believing that this can be accomplished simply by means of ground-to-air defensive systems is kind of ridiculous, and highlights a lack of practical experience among Western experts in conducting offensives against a large European power of equal or greater strength. Ultimately, the West should have facilitated the provision of modern Western fighter aircraft to Ukraine over a year ago when Ukraine first requested them. If they had, Ukrainian pilots and technicians would have been proficient before the start of the counteroffensive. Ukraine's Minister of Digital Transformation, Mikhailo Fedorov, announced a collaboration between Operation Unity, United 24, Come Back Alive, and Monobank to raise 235 million hryvnia, that's about 6.3 million U.S. dollars, to purchase 10,000 kamikaze drones. Drones are a game-changer on the battlefield and in combatants' abilities to reach targets behind the front line, and President Zelensky has emphasized that increased production of drones, as well as supplies from international partners, is one of Ukraine's most important tasks relating to offensive operations. A Lithuanian fundraising campaign to raise money for anti-drone and remote detonation equipment by Ukraine's Independence Day on August 24th has already exceeded its goal a week early. The fundraiser, initiated by Lithuanian journalist and activist Andrius Tapinas, has raised enough money to purchase 19 Skywiper Omni anti-drone systems and more than 40 RISE-1 remote detonation devices, both products of Lithuanian defense companies. The Skywiper Omni blocks drone control, video transmission, and navigation signals for up to 5 kilometers in all directions, and the RISE-1 allows remote detonation from a distance of up to 25 kilometers. Norwegian company Konigsberg Defense and Aerospace announced that it will supply Cortex Typhon C UAS anti drone systems valued at 71 million US dollars to Ukraine. Ukrainian company Athlon Avia is in the final stages of development for its ST 35 Silent Thunder loitering munition drone. According to CEO Artem Vyunuk, the system is designed to significantly elevate the precision and effectiveness of the Ukrainian armed forces. Russia is desperately trying to scale up development of anti-drone protection systems, so much so that effectiveness and reliability appear to be afterthoughts. A new electronic warfare system in their arsenal, called Pieroid, is a portable system designed to counter small UAVs and FPV drones deployed by Ukrainian forces. Experts examining the system, however, said that due to the shape of its antenna, it can only provide partial protection over a certain field— as opposed to 360 degrees, with an estimated range of 50 meters. It also has a 12-volt internal battery, with a continuous battery life of about 60 minutes without plugging it into external power like a car battery. Some quick assessment. It doesn't make much sense to put into production an electronic warfare system with so many serious flaws. It reminds us of the early introduction of the so-called cope cages on Russian tanks, 
that were primarily to convince Russian troops that Russian command were making an effort to minimize casualties. The Piedoid system isn't entirely useless, but it will only affect drones that fly into its antenna field within a range of 50 meters, which is limiting. The Swedish MOD announced that the country is preparing a new military assistance package for Ukraine worth around 290 million euros, which will include ammunition and spare parts for the Streitsforten 90 and Archer systems, as well as trucks and equipment for demining. In an effort to support Ukraine's air defense capabilities, Sweden has offered to sell AMRAAM air-to-air missiles to the United States, which could then be transferred to Ukraine. That's the brief for today. Remember to check your sources and don't fall for propaganda. Join us on YouTube and TikTok for more Ukraine content and live news reports. And please consider supporting our work on Substack. You'll find the links in the description. We'll be back tomorrow with more updates. Until then, stay safe, everyone.